Okay. Let's get started. So uh, this talk is about uh, multi-threaded device emulation in QEMU. Uh, my name is Stefan Heinutzi. I work on the uh, Red Hat KVM team. Um, let me start just by showing you what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to start with the things which are completed, recent things which we've done this year, um, which is the new uh, IO thread object and improvements to AIO context uh, that have evolved and allowed it to be used for uh, running uh, block IO outside the QMU global mutex. Um, I'm also going to discuss the remaining work for guest memory access outside the global mutex. Uh, and finally, I'm going to touch on the challenges of the multi queue block layer. So just to get started, why, why is multi-threading important in QEMU? Uh, in general, the problem is that although on a uniprocessor system, it's fairly simple to really use all resources simply by running your code, when you have more cores, in order to fully utilize the hardware, um, as long as your workload allows it, as long as your workload can be parallelized, or you have multiple threads, things that are happening at the same time, what you want to do is you want to use all CPUs so that you're actually fully utilizing your hardware. And historically, this wasn't really the way that QEMU was designed. QEMU, in some places, is more like the middle example, where um, although the guest could exploit parallelism, on the host side, QEMU is not exploiting parallelism. Uh, and that's exactly what this is about. Now, for, for vCPUs, luckily with KVM, we're, we're on the right side of this diagram. And we are able to run guest code in parallel for the most part. It, uh, it, everything is running in parallel there. But it's the hardware emulation, all that code inside the QME user space process, where uh, we still have a ways to go. Um, so this is what the talk is about. So how do we exploit SMP in QEMU? Um, so let me just show the, the, the general problem a little bit more in the architecture of what's going on. I just mentioned that the guest code in KVM can run. Um, what happens is on the host, you have separate threads. Uh, they're called vCPU threads. So the CPUs that you have inside your virtual machine uh, are running, executing guest code on the host. Now, that's the green region. That's when you're running code inside the guest. That could be the guest kernel or guest user space. You know, things can run in parallel there. Um, but what happens in KVM is eventually after running guest code, you're going to hit a VM exit. Something is going to yank you out of guest context and back onto the host. It could be an interrupt or it could be uh, uh, an IO access. So maybe the guest was trying to send a network packet and we're emulating the network interface card on the host. And when that happens, uh, we leave the guest mode, the, that green region over there, and we switch into either QEMU code or in the case of networking, if you're using vhostnet, we switch into some kernel code on the host there. The other thing going on in QEMU is we have a main loop, a thread, which takes care of all the other things besides running guest code. So that includes the monitor, uh, like the QMP monitor, the JSON RPC interface that gets used by libvirt or other management tools. Uh, it also includes other things like uh, the VNC, and some of the I.O. completions, they actually happen in the main loop because the guest threads are, are focused on getting into guest mode as quickly as possible and running as much guest code as possible. Now, the problem is that this blue region is where the QMU global mutex protects all the QMU code. So QMU written in C, most of the code in QMU takes this global mutex. And that means that only one of these threads can be in the blue region at any given time. Um, so there are places where we've been able to relax that. For example, when the main loop waits for file descriptor events, for example, it might be waiting for uh, the QMP monitor to, to, to receive a JSON RPC command. Uh, waiting for that socket obviously doesn't touch any memory or doesn't do anything inside QEMU. So we can release the lock and we just block in, in the poll system call. So that's this red region here. 
So basically, there are these three regions. And the real problem is that the blue region is still too big. There are performance critical things that we're doing that take the global mutex. So it would be nice to reduce those regions and be able to run more things like this red one here where we don't need to hold that lock and where we don't block the VM. So the consequence of blocking, by the way, is that if you do get stuck and block for a very long time in the blue region, is the monitor can hang, so QMU is no longer responsive. So libvirt or anyone else who wants to talk to QMU would notice that. But also the guests could get stuck because although it might be executing guest CPU instructions, as soon as it hits the next VM exit and it needs to take that global mutex again, there's gonna be mutex contention. You need to wait for the mutex to be released. So you really don't wanna get stuck. Here's the status of multi-threading in QMU 2.1. Um, as I mentioned, the KVM vCPUs, they happily run in parallel, so that's great. They, they are threaded. Uh, TCG is the just-in-time compiler, so if you want to run, say, ARM code on your x86 machine, the just-in-time compiler, uh, TCG, translates those ARM instructions into x86 instructions uh, and then jumps into that generated code. Um, it's, not, it's not truly thread-safe. There's some kind of experimental support for parts of it to support threading. Uh, but overall, especially for the system emulation mode where you would run a full ARM system, including hardware devices, um, that's not thread safe. And there's, there's current work and interest. People are getting together and, and starting to discuss that. That's not what this talk is about. This talk is about device emulation. Um, so we have Vert.io block where a few years ago uh, we found that there were performance problems because of this architecture here. Uh, we realized that if you're doing a lot of IOPS, especially if you have SMP guests, so you have multiple vCPU threads, if, if they are doing a lot of IO or trying to access multiple disks at the same time, it's a shame to get stuck in that blue region. So Vert.io block data plane is, is a solution for that. Uh, and that is upstream in QME 2.1, and that can take advantage of uh, multi-threading. Um, there's also Vertio SCSI data plane, which is in development now uh, by, by Pham Zeng. Um, and that's doing the same thing for the Vertio SCSI device. Uh, and then in live migration, we had a similar problem, where the live migration stuff was happening in the main loop. Uh, and while the guest is still running, and while we're taking dirty memory pages and sending them over to the destination host, uh, that can be expensive. QMU can do compression, for example. Um, and it's not a good idea to do that under the lock. So there's a separate thread that can do that. So that's another example of where we take advantage of multi-threading. But in general, the final item here, in general, devices do still emulate under the global mutex in QME user space. Okay, so before I go into detail about the various solutions and, and challenges, I just wanna point out that Although this is just a list of special cases where we said, aha, we need to make this multi-threaded to get scalability or to get this performance, um, does it make sense to go ahead and try to convert all devices uh, and just make everything thread safe and take advantage of, of multi-threading? And I think that the answer is no. I think that the approach that's being taken where people come along and say, look, I have a performance problem and I think this is silly, we should do this in, in threads, uh, is working well because trying to audit all the code in QMU is, is very invasive and you end up with more complicated code, right? You end up with um, constraints, uh, rules about the locking and stuff like that, which you don't have. If you know I'm under the global mutex, I can be simple, I don't need to take, um, take my own precautions. And the other important thing is that there is still a lot of code in QMU which is not necessarily high frequency and performance sensitive, doesn't get uh, run very often. So there's no real point in, in trying to make everything super thread safe. And we have this big historic code base. So the strategy that is really being taken is that people are coming and tackling performance problems and adding the multi-threading support where necessary. And this seems to be working. So my current focus is on Vertio block data plane. Uh, and the idea of data plane was that uh, if you have a, a guest, especially an SMP guest, that's trying to do things in parallel, but QMU forces all the I.O. to happen under the global mutex, the Vertio block emulation. Uh, we need to take that and move that out into its own thread so that it can run uh, without, uh, without affecting the VM, 
Uh, and so you can have multiple disks running at the same time if you have the host resources for it. Um, and the main challenges there that we still have to solve are the guest memory access, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, and right now I'm going to talk about the I.O. threads that we've introduced this year to allow you to manage how data plane works. So the I.O. thread object is a new object that was introduced this year. It now has libvirt support. Um, so previously, if any of you have tried out data plane, um, you, you may have had, if you were using libvirt, you had to pass through command line options uh, using the QMU. This, it has this bypass thing in the XML. Uh, so that's no longer the case now in, in new libvirt. Um, basically, it's, it's, it's all supported, and the way it works is that you can define IO thread objects. And each one of these IO thread objects uh, creates a thread in QEMU. And this thread runs an event loop. It's empty when you create it. It's not associated with any device. And now what you can do is when you instantiate Vertio block or in the future Vertio SCSI or anything else, you will be able to say, put this device on this IO thread. Just like the vCPU threads, by the way, there is a QMU command, uh, QMP command to query and find out the list of threads, get their task IDs. That way you can use CPU affinity to say, I want this IO thread to execute on this host CPU. And people are already using that for vCPUs to make sure that they can pin guest vCPUs onto host CPUs. So you can do the same thing now with IO threads. Uh, by the way, if anyone has a question as we go along, feel free to interrupt me. Um, don't need to wait till the end. Okay, so um, what's, what is the model? What is the threading model? Now that we can declare these threads, what do we do with them? Uh, the traditional model, which was the x data plane equals on one, for anyone who's already played with data plane, you'll know this one. It means one device, one disk, one vertio block device has one thread. That's fine if you're experimenting with just a few devices, but as soon as you want to run with lots of disks, it probably makes sense not to give them their own thread. So um, that's what this looks like. So now you can define IO threads, and probably a sensible way to split them up is to just have one IO thread per host CPU or, or a bit less than that. Uh, and then you can dish out your devices across these IO threads. QMU internally doesn't have any monitoring where it would watch to see which devices are being accessed a lot and auto balance it. It doesn't have any clever balancing where it decides where to put devices in order to uh, make things run best. So this does need to be done uh, manually at, at this point. Um, so I think as, as we get more experience with that and as people get performance results, and we, we might be able to uh, automate some of that just like the NUMA folks are, are automating NUMA things on the, on the host. Okay, so um, now I wanna, I wanna talk about uh, how this vertigo block data plane really works. I've explained that there's, there's a, a command line and a, a user interface to defining threads, and you can associate the disks with these IO threads, but how can this work? Well, the way it works is that this IO thread is a separate thread, it's running an event loop, um, and we don't actually do the same type of memory access dispatch in data plane as we do with a, a normal QMU device, a non-data plane QMU device. In a non-data plane QMU device, what happens is that QMU is sitting in an IOCTL, a KVM run IOCTL. It has just executed guest code and the guest submitted an IO request. So we get an exit, a VM exit. We come back to QMU user space. And the return value tells us that it's a PIO or an MMIO, uh, a hardware register access. And at that point, QMU will look up the device, which lives at that memory address, and it will invoke its read or write handler function. And, and then vertio block takes over and it says, okay, I've got a new request and it processes it. But we don't do that with data plane. The way it works is we use IO event FD. Uh, and IO event FD basically allows you to register special memory ranges in the kernel, the KVM kernel module knows about these special memory ranges because you've programmed them in using IOCTLs. Um, and then whenever there is an access to them, instead of exiting back to user space, it just signals the event FD, the file descriptor. 
So that means that this thread, this IO thread that's running here, is actually just is sitting in poll and it's just monitoring file descriptors. And when that event FD gets signaled, then uh, it it responds. It realizes, okay, there's more requests in my vert queue. I'm going to do some disk processing. Uh, and on the way back, when we complete a request, what we do is, oh, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, if you're doing this, you have a single disk running in a single I.O. thread, what happens if you're trying to access that disk uh, maybe from multiple vCPUs? Uh, isn't, isn't that in itself a bottleneck that we're only doing disk I.O. processing for a particular device in one thread? Shouldn't we have multiple queues, basically? And that's what the last part of this presentation is going to be about, so the multi-queue block layer work. Um, Okay, uh, and another change that was made this year is that previously the IO thread, what it did is it basically had its own copy of the vertio code, it had its own copy of Linux AIO raw disk IO code, uh, and w this year we were able to actually reuse the QMU block layer, which brings a lot of advantages. So in this diagram you can see that block driver state is in there, that's the QMU struct for a disk image. What that means is you get um, image formats, you get I.O. throttling, and you get all the QMU level storage features you can now use with, with data plane. Uh, and as of QMU 2.2, almost everything will be, uh, almost all of those features that you get without data plane will now be supported in data plane. <clears throat> okay. All right, so, so how does this work? Well, the main thing that we had to do, uh, the main changes we had to make, is we had to take the AIO context event loop uh, that QMU already had. It was using this for, 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 for block devices. So when you had a disk image, um, the file descriptors used for that disk image, any timers or bottom halves, which are basically deferred calls, um, they lived in the AIO context. Uh, and we use this AO context now in order to implement um, data plane. Uh, and the way it works is that the IO thread, it just grabs this event loop, it just acquires the context, and it tells it to wait for events and to dispatch them. That's the AIO poll call. So you just have this loop and you just have the IO thread sitting there. Uh, now the important thing is what this AIO context acquire and release provides is it has semantics that allow another thread to come along and acquire the AIO context. And once you've acquired the AIO context, it's, it's, it's basically a lock. It's now safe to access the resources that are inside that AIO context. So any of the devices that are being emulated in there, now that you've acquired the AIO context, it's safe to access them, there won't be a race condition because you've locked it. So that's the key thing, that's, that's how we make it uh, thread safe. Uh, and there's a couple of special uh, semantics of the way that this, this R FIFO lock works that we use, but the important thing is that basically in the AIO context, when you acquire it, if you remember, there's an IO thread that's running at the same time. Um, what happens is that if that IO thread is sitting there blocked waiting for more IO events to come in, it will be kicked and it will wake up and it will um, release the AIO context allowing another thread like the, the monitor to, to acquire that AIO context. And now that I've acquired the AIO context, it's safe to access the image, the disk image or whatever because I'm the, I'm the one who owns the context and no one else can go in and access the disk at the same time. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna explain a few more of the details and the constraints, not because I think that everyone here is working on uh, QMU block layer code, but because we can probably use exactly these same approaches for other subsystems. So if there has been, um, there has been work on Vertio net data plane, and they could probably use very similar approaches as well. So uh, I wanna show some of, the, some of the details here. So previously the block layer only ran on the global mutex. We never had to care about um, thread safety. 
And now what we've done is we've taken the disk image, the block driver state, and we've associated it with an IO context. And you can only access the block driver state when you own the AIO context. So that's the locking rule. And that way you can serialize access to it. <coughs> uh, and wh what we did is we just added an API to set the AIO context. So at runtime when QMU boots up, data plane is actually not active yet. Even though you have these IO threads, uh, you're not actually running in them yet. Um, so the disk image can still be accessed and you can move the AIO context, you can take the image and you can move it back to the main loop if necessary. For example, if you shut down the VertIO block device and you don't want to use data plane anymore, at runtime, you can move it back. Um, there are a few areas that are not protected by AIO context. For example, that global list of block drivers uh, the uh, block driver states, it's called B drive states. That is basically the list of drives in your QEMU VM. So if you drive add, drive add, drive add, several disks and you give them names, they are in this list. That list is global. So it's only protected by the global mutex. Um, and what that means is that if you're running in a random thread, uh, you can do IO, you can read, write, and you can take the IO paths, but you can't create new block driver states uh, and you can't delete them because this list is actually protected by the global mutex. So that's one thing to be aware of. It doesn't mean that all the block layer, everything's absolutely thread safe. It just means that the IO code paths that we use from threads are safe. Um, the other thing is lock ordering. So if QMU is now running using multiple threads and these threads are just accessing these different AIO contexts and they're locking them, how do we ensure that we never get into uh, a deadlock because of lock ordering. So if you have two threads, A and B, A has its own AIO context and now it needs to access the resource in B it, and it tries to lock um, AIO context B and the same thing is happening vice versa, B trying to lock A, the ABA uh, lock ordering problem. The way we solve that is right now, we just use the constraint that you're only allowed to acquire another AIO context if you're under QMU's global mutex. Uh, so in practice, what that means is that the QMU monitor, for example, the QMP, if you send uh, it a command like query, uh, query uh, block stats or something like that, and it needs to go ahead and access the disks, which may be running in another thread, since that's running on the global mutex, it's perfectly safe for it to lock those AIO contexts, go in and inspect the, the disks. But it means that the IO threads themselves can't just go all over the place and access um, each other's block driver states. Um, and even though this sounds limiting, it it's, works fine for all the block layer features that we've ported over. So uh, this appears to work. And it, um, I, guess, I guess at some point maybe we'll need to expand the model a bit in order to handle more complicated cases, but all the features we've ported have, have worked happily with this. So the final thing to be aware of is that previously in QMU, and this is a good example of why making things thread safe is making things a bit more complicated, is that previously if you had a uh, block driver state, when you opened that block driver state, it could open its file descriptors, it would add them to an event loop, and it would do, it would basically set up any timers or anything it needed. Well now, because you can switch AIO context, you can be moved between threads, what we need to do is we need to have separate APIs to do that. We have an API to attach to an event loop and we have an API to detach. Uh, so now you can be moved around. And I've gone through and I converted all the block drivers, uh, the local ones like the raw POSIX, but also the iSCSI network ones and everything. Um, and it's not hard, but it just means you need to re restructure the code a little bit. So if anyone is working on um, VertIonet data plane, um, I think that all these approaches that I've mentioned, it could be used for the net layer as well, the net subsystem. Um, and I think a lot of other devices. So you can use AIO context. It now has this acquire release. That's really what I'm trying to advertise. Let's move on though. That was all work that's complete. Uh, let's move on to the problems that we still have. First of all, in the beginning of this talk, I, I mentioned that we actually cheat 
when we execute in data plane mode, we're using IO event FD and we're using IRQ FD to communicate with the guest. The guest kicks us using IO event FD and we notify it back using the IRQ FD. Um, and we're not doing the normal QEMU memory dispatch where QEMU looks up, oh, which device lives at this address and then calls the handler. We're just relying on file descriptors. <clears throat> so that's actually a problem. Cheating like that works in some cases, but there are other cases where we're really gonna need to tackle this problem and solve it properly. <clears throat> okay, and, and, and those two open, open problems are the, for live migration, the guest memory dirty bitmap and recursive memory dispatch. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. Um, I mean, basically today what you can do using the memory API is you have thread safe access to mapping guest memory, but only RAM, not other devices. You can map guest RAM in a thread safe way. You can read and write to the RAM, but when you write to it, there's no thread safe way of updating the dirty memory bitmap. So what that means is that if you're using live migration, it's not really safe to access guest memory from another thread. And the way we get around this at the moment is for Verdeo block data plane, when migration is started, we actually disable it silently. We switch back to non-data plane mode and we keep running. So while you're doing live migration, you're no longer running in the IO thread. Instead, we use the old model, you're, still, you're getting invoked from the vCPU, and the main loop. So that's, that's a trick. And we need to fix that because, um, you know, really we want to be doing everything in data plane mode. Okay, so let's look at that dirty bitmap. So just to recap, the way it works in live migration is a guest could have way, way, way too much RAM to just stop the guest, copy the RAM, send it over a socket to another host for live migration. So the way that live migration works is that the guest continues running, and while it's running, we track the dirty pages of guest RAM. So whenever the VM writes to uh, a page in RAM, but also whenever a device DMAs to memory, say you read a block from the disk, that dirties memory, right, because it's gonna be written into RAM, then that page will be marked dirty. Uh, and then QMU can scan that dirty bitmap and it can send pages over to the destination host. And at the end, once, once live migration reaches its final phase, you have copied over all of RAM. And all the while the guest was running, which is important, because otherwise if you had stopped the guest, copied over all memory and then resumed it, um, you know, things could take an awful long time and it wouldn't be live. That's why it's called live migration. So um, the way this works is that there's a array, uh, a bitmap, uh, called dirty memory that's protected by the global mutex. And whenever an emulated device does some DMA, whenever we, you read a block from the disk or a network packet or you, you touch the graphics card or, or, or whatever, um, a bit will be set there. And then the migration code will scan that array and find those dirty bits. So there are basically three operations. We need to set dirty bits in a thread safe way. We need to be able to test and clear them. So that's test and clear is the atomic way of harvesting those bits out of the bitmap and clearing the bitmap. Um, and then we also have a bunch of callers who are still just using the get dirty function. And what, what that does is it just queries the bit, but it doesn't clean, clean the bitmap, it doesn't clear it. Uh, and I'm a little suspicious of those. I haven't written this code yet. It's probably what I'm gonna work on after KVM forum. Um, but the problem is that it's very likely that some of those callers are doing something that's not atomic because they're basically looking into the bitmap, thinking, oh. doing something, and then they set something in the bitmap later based on what they saw when they did get dirty. So that's not atomic. There's two points in time where they're accessing it. We need to convert that code to either using uh, test and, and clear or test and set or fetch and set dirty. Uh, but basically, the good news is that QEMU already has all the concepts and we have the atomic, uh, we can just use um, the atomic uh, wrappers that, that, that Paolo uh, added um, in order to make the bitmap dirty. That shouldn't be too difficult. So then the harder problem is the recursive memory dispatch. So even if we solve live migration, the really hard problem is the recursive memory dispatch. So there are situations where one device could do a DMA 
And the destination address that it's DMAing to is not RAM. Instead, it's another device. Another device's memory map registers or something like that. I don't really have any good examples here, but I think that a lot of, a lot of the discussions and people seem to agree that there are devices that do this. Um, the, simplest, the simplest example that I have, but I'm not sure that's how it's implemented in QMU, is if you do message signaled interrupts, right? Because message signaled interrupts means that a device writes to a magic address and some other device in the system, like an interrupt controller or the PCI host bridge, it detects that magic address and converts it into an interrupt. Um, but another example of where this could happen is say you had a, a simple bootloader, tried to, to use as little memory as possible. It could read the boot splash screen off the disk and just tell the storage controller to DMA it straight into the frame buffer. It's a made up example, but it's, uh, it's, it's one scenario where you can have one device accessing another device. Now what do we do if the SCSI controller is in IO thread one and the graphics card is in IO thread two? That's basically the problem. That's the curse of memory dispatch. Two devices talking to each other. So first of all, there's a, a lock ordering problem here. Because if device A talks to device B, what happens when device B talks to device A at the same time? If they need to lock each other, then you can get a deadlock. Uh, so the, the, the obvious solution is that we need to figure out what our locking discipline is. We probably need to release the lock. So we probably need to release the lock. Um, so th this, is the this is the next challenge uh, that we need to solve. Um, and I've bored you with the details, but the context of all of this is that the VertIO devices, they cheat, they're very easy. They don't use real DMA. The VertIO devices, they do require RAM, real guest RAM. That's not the case, well, with VertIO block, you require RAM. But that's not the case with other devices that we emulate. So if we want to emulate other devices in a thread, uh, they will do real DMA. And in that case, we really need to solve this recursive dispatch problem. Uh, and VertIO SCSI is actually the first one that does it because the generic SCSI code uses the, these B drive DMA read write routines, which use the memory lookup and therefore are exposed to recursive dispatch. Okay. So the final thing I wanted to talk about, and this was the, the question earlier on, was about the multi-queue block layer. So the Linux kernel now has multi-queue block layer support so that when you have a storage controller that gives you multiple queues, you can actually send I.O. requests down them independently. So multiple CPUs can be using them independently. Um, and Vertio block has been updated Vertio block has been extended. Traditionally, Vertio block had one command queue where you send disk read and write requests and everything. Well, now you can have multiple vert queues on Vertio block. Uh, so again, this is plumbing through the uh, multi-queue architecture. But QMU is a bottleneck here. So if we go back to the diagram we had in the very beginning of this, this talk, um, Vertigo block today without multi-queue is just the, the case on the left where you just have uh, the host doing work for one queue. Um, but Vertigo block with the multi-queue driver in the guest is basically the uh, second case where QEMU is still a bottleneck because we only have one either IO thread or one main loop that's, that's doing the work. What we really need to do is we really need to be able to let requests from the guest flow directly down onto the host to take advantage of the multi-queue features which have been added to Linux. But this is pretty hard. So this is, this is basically the next, the next step after data plane is complete and the data plane is pretty close to uh, completion for Vertio block. So for raw disk images, it needs to be cheap and it needs to be possible to do this. We need to be able to do it very fast and we need to be able to support multi-queue. Of course, for image formats, it gets a lot more complicated because there's just a much more complicated code path and the disk image formats themselves on disk, they have metadata and they weren't really designed for concurrent access. Instead, what we do is if there are multiple requests, we always take locks um, and that becomes even more painful in the multi-queue case.
pretty much anything that QEMU does um, is going to become a problem. I think I think I have some examples here, uh, like snapshot and resize. All of these things are going to conflict with it. Um, I think the most obvious thing to think about what is tricky to do multi queue is I/O throttling, because in I/O throttling you have a global limit and you say I want this disk to only do so me so much throughput, like 100 megabyte per second. So you had this global limit, but now you split it up into multiple queues that are supposed to be independent and not supposed to block each other, so what do you do? Uh, so we would need to think through all of those features. So here's the hack. Here's how we can do a prototype. Um, we already have the data plane code, so we already have the ability to run Verdeo block outside of the global mutex. So what we do is we just open multiple block driver states for the same disk image. Of course, it can only be raw, because if it's, if it's not a raw image, if it's a QCOW or a VMDK or, or whatever, uh, then QMU would get very, very confused, because it would see, use multiple um, metadata caches. When it reads metadata from the file, it would become inconsistent and it would corrupt. That's basically the same scenario as if you try to mount a file system from multiple hosts at the same time. It's not designed to be mounted from multiple hosts at the same time, and it will get corrupted. Okay, but for raw, for raw we could use this as a prototype. And then what we would do is we would run each queue as a separate thread. Uh, and of course, the problem at the bottom is that none of the image formats are supported. If you do snapshots or resize, it will be inconsistent. But this could be used for benchmarking. And I haven't implemented it yet, but I think this would be my first step because I want to see how much performance are we going to get if we if we can, can, can reach this, this stage on the right where we're really supporting multi-queue, we're really being able to do I.O. in parallel. But how could we do it better? Well, probably the right thing to do is to split up block driver state. You have the per disk state, which stays in block driver state, and then you have the per queue state. And then you only have to worry about locking and guarding the per disk state, because that's global. <laughs> but the per queue state is independent. And every, every vert queue that's running in a separate thread can just independently use its per queue state. So that's probably where we need to go, but this is hand-waving because there will be a lot of details we need to work through to make that work. But the end goal is real multi-queue, not QMU being a bottleneck and both the guest and the host having kernel multi-queue support. Okay, and that's the end. Uh, any questions? You talked about the locking rule uh, earlier. Is there anything that enforces that as part of the package? Nope. There is nothing that enforces that. Um, we might be able to add some assertions or something like that so that you will notice it if, if, if you do it the wrong way. Um, I think in theory we should be able to do that. So that makes sense. That's a good idea. Do we have any source tests that, that work the locking Um, I mean, the, IO, the AIO context with the R5 for lock, that has been in QEMU for, I think, two releases now, and we haven't, we haven't had issues. Because, by the way, you don't only use it for the data plane code path. You also use it just normally. AIO context is used all the time. Um, so I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that that's too much of a problem. It's not brand new, unstable. We don't know anything about how it's going to perform. I think that should be okay. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. So um, the question was whether we have tests, like torture tests for the, um, for, the, for the locking, and also whether we have kind of assertion or a way of detecting if you violate the constraints. Okay, so the question is about QCOW2. How do we do QCOW2 uh, in multi queue Because I was saying, let's focus on raw, because QCOW2 is hard. And I haven't thought about this a whole lot, but I think that the problem isn't just what's on disk. The problem isn't just how do we safely 
uh, update the on-disk metadata. The problem is also that everything in the QCA2 block driver, like the, the metadata cache, the L1, L2 table, the ref count caches, I mean, that all needs to be protected. Um, and then you have the operations which actually manipulate the metadata. So that all needs to be audited and, 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 and checked. Um, so that uses coroutines today. And we already use coroutine mutexes, but coroutine mutexes are a little bit different. Um, what they do is when you block because someone else holds that mutex, they yield back to the event loop and other code gets a chance to run. But if you use a pthread mutex, what happens when you, when you contend? Well, you're blocked and your process is just stopped. So it would basically block the event loop it's running in. So we need, to, we need something fancier than just a normal pthread mutex, I think. But we might be able to convert it. I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. Okay. So I guess the question is about the difference between multi-queue networking and multi-queue storage. Um, so the Vertio net is multi-queue uh, and both vhostnet, so vhostnet supports it. I'm actually not sure if we support it in user space. I don't know if anyone knows. Uh, if we do multi-queue Vertio net in user space, probably not. Um, so with vhostnet multi-queue, all of that happens in the kernel and bypasses QEMU. So the block layer is, like, is a very different code path. And especially the image formats that we were just talking about, there's just a lot more functionality and logic there uh, that's completely different, that hasn't been looked at yet, and we haven't figured out yet how to make it thread safe. That, that's why it's hard. We, we're not gonna get anything for free from networking. Uh, yeah. uh, Okay, so I, I'm not sure whether, whether you mean the, the locality of the I.O. thread and where it's doing its I.O. and on the host, the physical device and its interrupts. Is that what you mean? Okay. So, well, so that's an area where we do have to look at how uh, Vertio Net multi-queue uh, solve that problem uh, because we use MSI and we will have multiple interrupts, so we'll have to uh, we'll have to decide. Um, I mean, the important thing with the with the IO thread objects that I shown is that it is configurable, so there's not an automatic policy. In other words, you can set things up so that you have the correct affinity. So I, I think it would be possible to make sure that the vCPU and the IO thread are located closely together, and that you're using the correct, correct MSI vector so that you're also sending that interrupt to the correct vCPU. So, uh, the, the event activity mechanism you, you use to get the Bird.io events, is it specific for Bird.io or about any NMIO? No, I mean, basically, there's an IOCTL where you can tell the kernel uh, when the guest tries to access this memory range. It has a few other things. You can do like a data match as well. So you can say, if it writes this, this byte, then trigger. So it's generic, but it's KVM only. Uh, so, you know, for QMU, TCG, for example, we don't have it. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so the question is whether, um, with regards to CPU affinity, whether it actually is a lot better to create just a few I.O. threads and put devices in them, rather than to have one thread per device? And actually, no, the answer to that is no. I, 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 haven't, I haven't run benchmarks yet to test out the limits. Maybe some people here have, because I know people have been experimenting with uh, like the, the, basically the characteristics of it. Did you have some kind of idea on what we were expecting to see? Yeah, yeah, so just the, I guess the, the response was that, you know, the, the, the end to end mapping may not be necessary. Uh, we might be just fine doing the one to one if we just trust the kernel um, and have a lot of threads. Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll end it here. Uh, I'll be around if anyone still wants to chat afterwards. Thank you.